Zeitgeist presents Bus Bike Walk 2022. Thank you to all of the sponsors and community partners who helped to make this event possible. Thank you so much, Mayor Payne, Mayor Larson. Um, it is uh, my great pleasure now to introduce our keynote speaker. Peter Wagenius is the Legislative and Policy Director at the Sierra Club's North Star Chapter. He's worked within the system on pol as Policy Director for the City of Minneapolis. He's championed transportation projects in the Twin Cities, including the 20-year plan to, uh, to rebuild parks and streets, the bus rapid transit along 35W, and has been at the forefront of policy and infrastructure advocacy to create more healthy and sustainable communities. And given his background, you wouldn't be surprised. He doesn't just put his money where his mouth is. He puts his bike tires where the pavement is. He is out on the street chauffeuring his kids around on his long tail cargo bike. Um, and it was a treat to bike with you today. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much. Um, so having worked for Mayor Ryback and Mayor Hodges in the city of Minneapolis for 16 years on both the city budget and on transportation, I know the following is true. Designing city streets for everyone, people of every age and ability, people walking, biking, driving or taking transit gets us so many benefits. When we break down the myths that hold us back, we can make real advancements in public health, in safety, in equity, access to jobs, economic vitality, and sustainability. A stronger, more connected community is ours if we want it. My experience at City Hall tells me that's true. And here's part of how I know. As part of the last census, and this was after I left the city, they tracked how the city had progressed over the previous 10 years. And they learned that the city of Minneapolis population had dramatically increased and vehicle miles traveled in the city had simultaneously decreased. Think about that for a second. There's all kinds of people who would tell you that's not even a thing, that's not even possible, and yet it happened in the city of Minneapolis. A dramatic increase in population and a significant decrease in vehicle miles traveled. The, when I entered the city service in 2002, the people who came in at that time in the midst of a fiscal crisis would not have believed that po was possible, let alone people in the 70s and 80s who thought that cities were dying nationwide. But we succeeded. There's still plenty of work to do. And there's one more benefit that I, I, I didn't mention, Mayor Larson, Mayor, Mayor Payne, tax base. All of those things I described that are good for people are good for cities on the bottom line. Because I saw that people are attracted to live in communities that have those qualities. And I know you're on your way. Andrea sent me the documents, and I read them all, from your 2017 planning process for uh, your 2035 plan. I know you're on your way. I saw the comparisons with like cities, with uh, Mankato and Rochester and Madison. Um, I saw the uh, city's traffic patterns, the values. You're on your way. So I don't assume that anybody here needs to be persuaded of all those benefits from the type of city you get to build. I don't think you need to be persuaded. So instead, I'm going to focus on some of the lessons we learned so that we can get to faster implementation. Some lessons learned and dismantling some of the myths that hold us back. So when we took office in Minneapolis, uh, downtown transit in Minneapolis was a mess. We inherited a system that had basically not changed since 1974. You all know Nicollet Mall in downtown Minneapolis? OK, dedicated to transit and pedestrians um, next to that were two streets, Marquette and Sac, and each of which had a single counterflow lane. And I'm going to try and keep the nerdery down, but I know there's some city staff, and I, don't wanna, I, want, I want to get some nerdery in for the city staff. A single counterflow lane to handle all the buses that came in off 35W. Nothing would move. Nothing would move. Every bus was only as fast as the slowest bus. So we invested, this was toward the end of Mayor Ryback's first term, in a million dollars to develop a plan. And oh my god, people said, what are you doing? We're coming out of a fiscal crisis. You're spending a million dollars on a plan that you have no money to implement. A million dollars for a plan and you have no money to implement it? That's crazy, Mayor Ryback. Peter, what are you doing? Let me tell you what happened. We developed that plan. 
And thank God we did it when we did it, because we got done about two weeks before a federal funding stream opened up in the Bush administration, not a particularly city-friendly administration called the Urban Partnership Agreement. And we raced to get the documents together and ended up finalizing the plan and applying for federal money on the same day in 2007. And that million dollar investment got us $34 million from the Bush administration to rebuild those two streets where there was that single lane and we made them double lanes. So transit, two lanes for transit, a, a stopping lane and a passing lane. Instead of doubling transit capacity, we more than tripled transit capacity and we paved the way for uh, building a new bus rapid transit to downtown Minneapolis called the Orange Line, which just opened this last December. The moral of the story, lesson learned number one, it's always worth it to have a plan. It's worth it to pay for a plan because you never know when the funding's gonna arrive. And we're seeing that now with cities all like, oh, wait a minute, there's this federal money. The, the best time was in the past, the next best time is right now. Another lesson learned from that experience, which I'll maybe get into a little later if we have time for some nerdery, is building a street city around a complete streets philosophy means that every street is safe. It means the system works for all users. Every street is safe, but that doesn't mean every street is the same. Think about how that applies to you. I see some city staff here. Every street is safe, but not every street is the same. Another thing I learned, here's another lesson learned, and this is from Green Line LRT. You know Green Line LRT from downtown Minneapolis, downtown St. Paul, right through the middle of the University of Minnesota campus? Anybody been on that? Anybody seen it? Okay, fantastic. So we all know that people fear the idea of change. It's one of the things that leaders like Mayor Payne and, and Mayor Larson struggle with. People can fear change. It's true. Before the fact, people fear change. And I want to help you all become more effective advocates for people to get over those fears to build the visionary projects that you want to build. Part of how you can get them past it is to remember, yes, people fear change before the fact. It is also true that people are remarkably adaptable to change after the fact. So what am I talking about? Green Line LRT. We had to do two amazingly huge hard things to get that project built. We had to close off Washington Avenue through the middle of the University of Minnesota campus entirely to automobiles, not just to take a lane for the trains, but a second lane for the buses. We, sh we shut off a major arterial through the middle of the campus. Believe me, there were people who had concerns about that. <laughs> we also had to eliminate every parking space from the university to downtown St. Paul. These were controversial decisions. You wouldn't believe it based on that controversy. But here's what happened when we were all done. You know how many people talked about it, the, the loss of the parking after the fact? You remember, know how many complaints we got? Zero. Zero. And there's two things to know about that. One is that um, people measure what they lost compared to what they got. And oftentimes in these projects, we spend all our time trying to sand down the edges to make sure that they, they aren't scary to people. And we forget to make them so awesome that when construction is done, they forget about what, we, what, it, what might have been there before. I don't hear quite, uh, complaints about parking. I hear raves about how awesome the train is. That's what I hear. Um, Another moral of the story is take full advantage of reconstruction. If you ever get a chance to rebuild a street from scratch, and you all know, we don't get to do that very often, right? You know, you do these, these surface overlays, you do these repaintings, you do these patch jobs. When you get to rebuild a street from scratch, take advantage. You know why people didn't miss the parking that disappeared from that huge stretch between the two downtowns? Because the parking was gone during construction anyway. It's gone during construction anyway. They don't miss it. They've already adapted to its absence by the time you get to the end. They've already adapted. So seize those opportunities. Paint a big vision. And don't worry, because here's one of the things I learned looking at all those big projects we did. It's amazing how many projects were controversial during the planning process and are not remotely controversial. I, I talk, talk to people who don't know the history of these projects, and sometimes they're shocked when they realize, oh, was, was, was there ever a disagreement about this? Seriously, Mark II, 
Blue Line LRT, Green Line LRT, Open Streets. I got to tell you about Open Streets. We've been doing Open Streets in the city of Minneapolis for 11 years. Does anybody know what o Open Streets is? Ciclo Via? Okay, you shut down the street on a Saturday or a Sunday from like 10 to 5. It's an all day thing. You turn the city itself into, the street itself into public space, and people love it. At the, in the beginning, they weren't even programmed. It was just people reclaiming the street as their space, and they loved it. The first year we did that, we did it on Lindale Avenue. We only did one that first summer, 2011. We did it on Lindale Avenue, and the business is on Lindale Avenue. Oh, they were, oh, I don't know about this. This is going to be bad for business. Ooh. You'd never know that today, because now we do six or seven of them every year. And every year, different council members fight in the city of Minneapolis for, I want one of these in my neighborhood this year. But you know which street gets it every single year? Lindale. Because those same business owners say, no, 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 no. We've claimed our spot. We, we did it first. We did it first. So every year, seven or eight spots are available for other streets. Lindale gets it every year. The same street where there's like, oh, I don't know if this is good. Because it was great for commerce. Because you know what's hard to tell when you're looking at a business? When you're driving by it at 30 miles an hour, it's hard to tell what they're selling. But when people are reclaiming the street and seeing it, it's really good for commerce. Four to three conversions. We've done a ton of four to three conversions. You know what a four to three conversion is? I'm seeing some nods. A four lane road uh, converted to a three lane road. We've done a ton of them. You know how many of them we've reversed? Zero. Because they're great, they're safer, and they have pretty much the same capacity as a four lane road. It's really close in terms of capacity, but in terms of safety, it's so much better. It's so much better in terms of safety. Dedicated transit lanes. City of Minneapolis has voted 12 times to dedicate lanes to transit. How many of them have been reversed? One, because it was replaced by an even better facility on the neighboring street. Dedicated bicycle lanes, they, people love the dedicated bicycle lanes. There's a reason that, there's two that are still controversial, and I'd be happy to talk to you about that in the Q&A. But most of them are incredibly popular because they're well used, because we built a whole system. Senator Dibble, who's the chair of the, used to be the chair of the Senate Transportation Committee, told me a story, and this is part of what I want to make sure to leave with you, is that he said, we don't actually help ourselves when we, when we go to these openings of these fantastic projects, and we just talk about the kumbaya of how everybody celebrates it after the fact. I want to tell you that because it's important to know that if you have the vision, if you support visionary leaders and help them advocate to get great projects built, that people will celebrate it. But it's worth remembering the fights that went into making them happen. Because otherwise, you can think to yourself, oh, well, that's a Minneapolis thing. We can't do that in this community. But let me tell you, when I was doing these projects, we can't do that in Minneapolis. That's a Seattle thing. We can't do that here. You can do anything you want to do here in Duluth. And it's helpful to remember the fact that it was a fight and the fact that the controversy disappeared after the fact. Um, I want to end on this thought and then take some, take some, uh, some Q&A. The best thing I saw, Mayor Larson, from your 2017 process, the 2035 plan, I'm not giving that the right name. The best page was number eight of the third session. It described the transportation for all vision, which advocated for, quote, a Duluth transportation and infrastructure system that focuses on traditional values of health and fairness, people's health and fairness, rather than the modern value of moving cars. I, I'm such a nerd, I almost got teared up when I saw, read that. <laughs> it resonates with me because there's this notion out there that we need to look to faraway places for inspiration to build more livable cities. Uh, that what we envision for our cities is foreign, it's not foreign. Some of it is in our own history. We should not be afraid to take inspiration from, from faraway places, absolutely not. But part of how Minneapolis became a top-ranked city for bicycling, as an example, was embracing and building on our own history, our own unique history and our own unique assets. The story of biking in Minneapolis is real simple. There were three waves, generations of investment. There was a generation that saw, hey, we're, we're Minneapolis, we're the city of lakes. We're going to build bike paths around these lakes. And infrastructure created culture. There became a culture of recreational biking around those assets. And then another generation saw, oh, these railroads, the tracks are gone. We're going to turn rails into trails. And that created a 
a ridership and a culture of, oh, biking isn't just for recreation. Biking is for commuting to your work, to your job. And now we're in the third, we're well into the third frontier now, where it's not just, we're building on bike as recreation and bike as commuting to now reclaim city streets. Biking as a complete lifestyle. Biking as something you can take to get anywhere, anytime, for anything. That's us embracing our own history. Biking was a wild craze in Minneapolis and in cities across the country in the 1890s. Did you know that? When they first invented the safety bike, it was huge. It was amazing. So when you think about Duluth, think about your natural and historic assets, the wonderful th things that you were blessed with, Lake Superior, the topography, which is an asset, the spectacular views of the lake, which is an asset, and your historic assets, including the canal, the great dense housing stock you have, and the one thing I didn't see in your 2017 plan, but I got to brag about, because it's something that Duluth, and I assume Superior, and Minneapolis all share, which is your street is built on a grid. Do you all know how precious that is? Do you all know how, be how beautiful? I'm, I'm, I'm in the nerdery, but I want to explain something to you. I live diagonal from my parents in the city of Minneapolis. Grids are all about choice. I can, I can come up with 40 different ways to get to my parents' house from my house. And there are all kinds of communities that were built in the 50s and 60s where you literally can't do that because they're not designed around choice. They're not designed around a grid. You can seize that opportunity in ways that you have maybe haven't even imagined yet. The way we fix downtown Minneapolis Remember what I said before, safe streets are safe for, uh, uh, complete streets are safe for all users, but they're not the same for all users. We decided there was a street downtown that was gonna have double wide transit lanes. And we decided that next to that, there was gonna be a street for local buses. And we decided that next to that, there was gonna be a street for a dedicated bike lanes. You can do that. You can do that. West Duluth, you could do that. You could say, well, this is the street where Write the plan now, and maybe the funding doesn't arrive for eight or nine years. Maybe it arrives in two years. Maybe you'll be glad you did the plan. But you can decide this is the street that's going to have a dedicated lane for transit, and this one next to it is going to be the one that's have, going to have protected bike lanes. So I'm going to throw out a couple of myths that I didn't get a chance to, to, to throw, but they might inspire some questions for you. Quick, a uh, rapid round of myths. Myth. It's not worthwhile to build something unless people use it 24-7, 365 days a year. That goes along with the, you all can't do this because you have winters in Minnesota. Well, winters in Minneapolis are, are pretty bad, just like winters in Superior and winters in Duluth. Didn't hold us back. Didn't hold us back. It turns out the winter is not an impediment because actually it's the hottest cities in America where people don't want to bike because they show up all sweaty to work. It's not an impediment. Here's another, here's another uh, myth that holds us back. Well, if you push traffic on one street, it just pops up on another. We have 70 years of data that shows that's actually not true. Some of it can, it can, but if you build it, they will come is not just a line from a movie. It's actually true. Again, remember what I said? In Minneapolis, we dramatically increased the population while de decreasing VMT because we built facilities great enough that people got out of their cars. They took the other options because they were provided to them. So your vision for your city, your advocacy is all worthwhile and you'll be rewarded for it. You might have to go through some, some controversial conversations, um, but everything you do is worthwhile. Thank you so much for letting me throw some ideas at you. And do folks have, do we have time for questions still? Yeah, we're gonna take a couple minutes for questions. Couple minutes for questions. I must have sparked something. I wanna know how you guys interact, or how, who interacts with Google and Apple Maps? Because I am totally reliant on that now. Google Maps is what I use for everything. Route. And so I'm wondering, like in Minneapolis, some of the routes are set for hills. So I'm thinking, 
Uh -huh. It would be nice if who, who interacts with those apps to then create device drops because I think they could be done a better job with those apps. I'll admit you might be out of my expertise. There are people at Nice Ride Minnesota that I could connect with you with who have done the uh, RFID technology where they track people, how they, bikes and how they bike, and that helps to inform better maps. Um, I I'm not the expert on that. I can tell you, though, since you brought it up, though, that people's ability to do Google Maps have actually changed the way people commute in a bunch of different ways, including that you know, economists have been knocking on the door of engineers for the past decades trying to get them to understand you can't build your wide out of congestion because there's this thing called induced demand. If you build more roads, people drive more. If you build more transit, people ride more. If you build more for everything, if you build more of it, people use more of it. There's some data that says it's actually been magnified. Induced demand has actually gotten worse because of those apps because people think, oh, well, I was gonna, I was gonna drive to the restaurant 15 minutes away but they built this new road, so now I can drive to the, to the restaurant that was 45 minutes away, but it's now 30 minutes away because they built the new road. Induced demand is a real thing. You build more of something, and the, the, the apps are, are actually working against us in some ways. Um, I'll try and find, connect you with people at Nice Ride to answer the, your more specific question. Other thoughts, questions? Right here. Mm -hmm. Both. When I talked about those three generations of investment, some of that definitely preceded the, the, the recreational culture, the bicycling is commuter culture, but it just so happens uh, that one of the leaders in one of those industries with uh, uh, with uh, quality bike products, Nick Mason, was the chair of our Minneapolis Bicycle Advisory Committee that I served on for 16 years. We just lost him to Stockholm, by the way. Um, uh, they were a critical part of advocacy, no question. I don't want to convey, though, that the economic benefit that you get from biking is from the biking industry. That's, that's icing on the cake. The cake is people want to live here because they want to live around those assets. There's a thing, you all know transit-oriented development, you've all heard that phrase, transit-oriented development, development that pops up around transit. Minneapolis is now famous for bicycle-oriented development. That's actually a thing. The Midtown Greenway is so successful in Minneapolis, former rail corridor, it has more traffic on it than 90% of Minneapolis streets. And from uptown, every year there's another one moving, moving eastward towards St. Paul. There's another uh, development of people who just want to live near it because it's so awesome. The lake is pretty damn awesome. You could have bicycle and transit-oriented development in Duluth. That's the, that's the cake. The icing is, is the bike industry as well. It's all going to be part of your, your, what do they call it, the triple bottom line for making these investments. Other thoughts? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know, this isn't even a question, but maybe I'll just add some comments. But I just want to, so many of your points ring so true. And so we're here on 6th Avenue East, right? Because 6th Avenue East has recently been added to the city's reconstruction list somewhere in the next 48 years, probably. So, you know, that's what we're trying to do, right, is gather revisions to build a plan. But as you look at that street, I mean, is there anything you, you see on 6th Avenue East that you think we should be thinking about as we are building that community vision? By the way, everyone do the walking tour, so you can add your thoughts to that vision after this. But what's your thoughts? You know, you, you've been through it a bunch of times. 6th Avenue East is this avenue that runs up and down the hill, and that's what we want to spark conversation around. Have you looked at it? Do you have any thoughts that you'd want to share with us that we think about? Well, I... I did look a, a little bit online, and believe me, I had my eye on it as I was coming through here. It's obviously not a safe model. Um, it's worth knowing, by the way, that the four to three lane conversion craze that has been going on for 
like two decades. It was underway when I started at the city of Minneapolis because there is an inherent safety to a three-lane road compared to a four-lane road. You don't know what people are going to do in that left-hand lane. Are they turning? Are they going straight? That is inherently unsafe. And there's no version of a four-lane road that can match the safety of, oh, that, that lane is a turn lane. And the people in the turn lane are turning because that's what it's for. It's a turn lane. It is superior. This is what everybody figured out. The, the, the three-lane road has comparable, not the same, but comparable capacity. Uh, and again, you're in a grid. If you do have a reduction in traffic and it pops up a little bit somewhere else, it can. But when people have choices, that shouldn't be that frightening. Um, there is an inherent safety in a in three-lane design. Now, I haven't talked to the engineers. I've biked over it. But there are a lot of corridors that look like that. Lindale Avenue. I talked about Lindale Avenue, the commercial section. To the south of there, um, it used to be a four-lane road. And they converted it into a three-lane road. There, uh, I mean, look at the traffic numbers for 50th in the city of Minneapolis, heading to 50th in France, you know, at the Dinah border with the Dinah Theater. That's a busy road. They turned it into a three-lane road. It still flows. It's dramatically safer. It's dramatically safer. So I would encourage you to be really open to, to uh, those, uh, those kind of designs. Mm -hmm. And by the way, sometimes there, sometimes you end up with, <laughs> there's a lot of bike lanes in Minneapolis that are byproduct bike lanes. Have you ever heard that term, a byproduct bike lane? They didn't go into the street with the intention of building a bike lane. They went into the, into the street, the engineers, with the intention of making it safer. So they did a four to three lane conversion. They figured out, well, we have, we don't have enough space left for a five lane road, but we do have enough space for bike lanes. So they put bike lanes in. And it turned out to be an extra win, but it literally was extra. The intention of the engineers was, let's just make this safer. Let's make it safer for pedestrians to cross the street. And it ended up being even better because, the, because they reprogrammed the existing space. They were able to put bump outs at intersections. You all know what I mean when I say bump outs? You know, those curb extensions that shorten the crossing distance? That is a huge difference, which it's really hard to do with a four-lane road, but you can do with a three-lane road. Thank you so much for bringing that up. There, there are serious safety issues, yes. and there, there are equity issues that go along with those safety issues. Who's crossing the street? Who is it more difficult to cross the street? I can't go across the street with my five-year-old, my eight-year-old as fast as I can when it's just me. Uh, you all know the concept of an 880 city, a city that's designed where every intersection works for you, even if you're eight, like my Cholula right here, or 80 years old. An 880 city, that's a real thing. That's a more equitable city when you design a city like that. I've got a book. I meant to hold it up as a, as a prop, and I left it in my bike bag. It's called Walkable Cities by Jeff Speck. He has a sequel called Walkable City Rules. The only flaw with the first book is it draws this distinction between cities and suburbs, and sometimes people read it, and they're like, I'm from a suburb. Well, you're from a city, so you should have no problem. Duluth is a city, and you can demand everything in that book. And it's got all the arguments for why it's so useful. I can recommend some other resources to you as well. But it's definitely an equity issue. It's a justice issue. It's a safety issue. And all of those arguments should buoy your work and inform it. Uh-oh, I'm pushing it. There's one more. Oh my God, I'm so glad you asked me that because most of what I've been bringing here is my experience from Minneapolis. I do lobby for Sierra Club, so you're speaking right to my heart. So uh, at Sierra Club, we are lobbying at the state level and at the federal level um, for uh, uh, electric vehicle rebates. 
and we just got a change to the draft that came from the state. I think Zach Stevenson is the author from Coon Rapids, a Democrat, to include um, electric cargo bikes along with the definition of electric vehicles. So, um, I, I, but the great thing about working at Sierra Club is I don't need to pretend to not be opinionated. <laughs> we need to elect new people in order to make that happen. So, um, I've worked with your legislators. I think they're fantastic. Um, but there are neighboring districts around here uh, uh, that where we need to elect people who will vote for those kinds of things. Um, we also need to get funding for transit projects so that the, the projects that we were talking about are ones that, that these mayors can access to advance their projects. Um, so that is very specifically on people's minds. And I need to leave you with one stat um, on climate, because after all, I do work for Sierra Club. One of the arguments, because they always have a new set of arguments to, to argue against change. One of the arguments is, oh, well, we don't need better facilities for pedestrians. We don't need better facilities for bikes. We don't need better transit, because electric cars will save us from the climate crisis. And, and I want to tell you, I want everybody to hear this. There is no data to support the idea that we can address emissions from the transportation sector, I'm talking about climate emissions, there's no data to say we can do that through electrification alone. You cannot do it. We have to also reduce vehicle miles traveled. Um, you have this great new city staffer, Mindy Granley. I think who you hired, she serves on the Sustainable Transportation Advisory Council with me. She's fantastic. I've been on it two years, she just joined. We pushed MnDOT to adopt a goal to reduce vehicle miles traveled by 20% in the state of Minnesota between now and 2050. There is no path to climate action that doesn't include that. None. And if we have to hit 20% statewide, that means that people, cities like Minneapolis have to hit like 40%. That means cities like Duluth have to hit like 30%. That's, that's what the future requires. And I've been, in, I've been in meetings with like people who were paid with electric vehicle grants who could not make the math work without it. So trust me when I say that. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you, Andrea. Really appreciate it.